Mitfeld Kingdom, were notoriously known for their aggressive expansionist policies, had been building up their military for months and rumors of an impending invasion of UNS space had been circulating for weeks. The UNS government, however, had been playing it cool, officially stating that the Navy was simply conducting a military exercise. But behind closed doors, the truth was far more dire. The UNS was preparing for a defense against a possible Mitfell invasion, and the Navy's exercise was all about repelling just such an attack. As the Navy stood at the ready, secret diplomatic negotiations were taking place in the home capital of Sanctuary. Human diplomats sat across from their Mitfell counterparts, their expressions serious as they revealed that they knew of the Mitfell's plans to invade UNS space. They warned the Mitfell that any attempt to invade would result in the unnecessary deaths of their own people. The Mitfell diplomats acknowledged the message and warning given by the UNS government, but gave no further reply. The room fell silent as the weight of the situation settled over them. It was clear that the fate of the two nations hung in the balance, and one wrong move could lead to all-out war. As the negotiations concluded, the UNS Navy remained at the ready, prepared to defend their home and protect their people. The Mitfell Kingdom, for their part, seemed to be reconsidering their plans for invasion. But the tension between the two nations remained high, and the standoff continued. With rumors of an impending invasion by the Mitfell circulated to the public, the UNS government knew they had to take drastic measures to protect their people and their space. On July 24, 2264, the UNS government officially established the Office of Interstellar Strategic Services ISS, a foreign intelligence agency tasked with gathering, processing, and analyzing national security information around the galaxy and performing covert operations. Ambassador Ariana de Sigillo, the first head of the agency, was given a daunting task by the UNS government to establish a spy network within the Mitfell Kingdom. It was a risky move, but one that could potentially give the UNS valuable intelligence on the Mythfell's plans. On December 18, 2266, the UNS Navy and government officials received a surprise when the Mythfell Navy withdrew their forces. The Mythfell military withdrawal was confirmed by the ISS intelligence agency, who reported that a war had broken out between the Prakiti fanatical purifiers and Mythfell Enlightened Kingdom. UNS government and military officials were relieved that a possible full-scale war against the Mitfell Kingdom was averted, at least for the time being. However, peace was short-lived as on November 30, 2271, war came again to the UNS southern doorstep. This time, it was not the Mitfell species who came looking for bloodshed, but the Prakiki Ti species, a small lizard-like creature very similar to a gecko on Old Earth. The war that the Pricky TI unleashed on the UNS government was quick and brutal. Advancing system after system, leaving only death and destruction in its wake. Admiral Johann Bauer and Admiral Andrew Stanley were ordered by the UNS military command to withdraw and proceed to the Roselhake star system and muster all available UNS military forces in order to stop the Prakiki TI advance. The two admirals were tasked with leading the UNS military forces in a desperate effort to stop the Prakiki TI from advancing further and protect the UNS citizens from their brutal onslaught. As the UNS military forces gathered in the Roselhaag star system, they prepared for a long and grueling battle. The Prakiki TI were a formidable enemy, known for their brutal tactics. On June 17, 2272, the Prakiki Ti fleet appeared from orbit above New Amsterdam and immediately began bombarding the world. Soon after, the Prakiki Ti army made orbital landings and assaulted the main city of New Amsterdam. The local UNS army was overwhelmed by the enemy numbers and for the very first time, the UNS government activated and deployed its Lazarus soldier program to the front lines in New Amsterdam. These soldiers, created through advanced technology and reanimation techniques, were nearly invulnerable to injury and could withstand heavy firepower. With the deployment of the Lazarus soldiers in multiple battlefields of New Amsterdam, the tide of the battle began to turn. The Prakiki Ti invaders were met with an unexpected and formidable enemy. The Lazarus soldiers fought fiercely, pushing back the enemy and crushing their numbers. The Prakiki Ti were not prepared for this new type of enemy and were caught off guard. As the battle raged on, the local UNS army and the Lazarus soldiers fought side by side, pushing the Prakiki Ti invaders back and retaking the cities of New Amsterdam. 
the Prakiki Ti invaders were eventually repelled, and the UNS forces were able to successfully retake the multiple cities. The deployment of the Lazarus soldiers proved to be a decisive factor in the battle for New Amsterdam. These undead soldiers had saved the multiple cities and potentially the whole planet from certain destruction. The UNS government and military officials breathed a sigh of relief, knowing the catastrophe and saved countless lives. The Lazarus soldiers had become an essential part of the UNS military, and the UNS government was certain that they would continue to be deployed in future battles against the Prakiki Ti. As the war between the UNS and the Prakiki Ti raged on, the UNS military had suffered several naval defeats, and it seemed that the Prakiki Ti were on the verge of breaking through to the core systems of UNS space. But on December 28, 2272, a pivotal moment in the war occurred, the naval battle of Salino Star System. Admiral Andrew Stanley and Admiral Johann Bauer were tasked with leading the UNS Navy in this crucial battle. The Prakiki Ti fleet had been advancing towards the core systems of UNS space, and if they were able to break through, it would spell doom for humanity. The fate of the war rested on the outcome of this battle. As the two fleets engaged in battle, the UNS Navy fought bravely but was outmatched by the Prakiki Ti's. It seemed as if all was lost, and the Prakiki Ti would break through to the core systems of UNS space. But in a moment of desperation, Admiral Stanley and Admiral Bauer came up with a bold and risky plan to ambush the pursuing fleet. The victory at the Battle of Salino signaled the beginning of a great counter-offensive of the UNS military against the Prakiki Ti. The UNS military began to retake the star systems that the Prakiki Ti had taken and occupied, and capturing several star systems on Prakiki Ti territory. The UNS Navy and the UNS Army fought with renewed vigor, knowing that they had a chance to win the war. Elsewhere in UNS space, a team of scientists on Sanctuary made a groundbreaking discovery. After an intense study of recovered artifacts from the now extinct First League, they were able to deduce the exact galactic coordinates of Funhabani's, the home system of the Great First League. The UNS government quickly dispatched the nearest science vessel, the UNS Hawking, commanded by scientist Joaquin Solano, to investigate and survey the Funhabani system. As the UNS Hawking approached the Funhabani's planet, science officer Joaquin Solano and his team were filled with excitement and anticipation. They knew that this planet could hold the key to unlocking the mysteries of the First League, a civilization that had vanished without a trace several millennia ago. As they conducted their investigations, Solano and his team were amazed by what they found. Fun Habani's planet was the administrative center of the First League throughout its existence and served as the seat of their Great Senate. The planet was densely populated with a planet-wide city covering most of the surface. Food had to be imported from other member worlds to support the untold billions living in the enormous metropolis. But as they delved deeper into their research, the team was struck by a sense of foreboding. When the league collapsed, food shipments on this world ceased virtually overnight. Mass starvation and anarchy followed as the planet was carved between warlords and criminal organizations. The population dwindled within a few centuries until the planet was reduced to a lifeless ghost world. As Solano and his team gazed out at the barren wasteland that was once a thriving civilization, they couldn't help but feel a sense of sadness and loss. But they also knew that this discovery could be a valuable lesson for humanity. The government launched a colonization program, with the goal of restoring Fan Habanis and turning it into a heavy industrial world for both UNS military complex industries and civilian heavy industries. They knew it would be a difficult task, but they were determined to make it happen. As the first ships landed on the planet's surface, the colonists knew they had a monumental task ahead of them. But they were excited, full of hope and determination. They knew that the planet would be renamed, no longer to be called Fan Habanis, but New Singapore.